joined today by author um, Christopher McIntosh, uh, author of the excellent new book, uh, Occult Russia, which I have here in my hands. Um, thanks for coming on the show, Christopher. How have you been? Very well, thanks. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's a privilege. And um, the, you, you're, you're, you've written so many things over the years as well. I mean, I'm, I'm very mindful of the, the Elif, LFS Levy uh, biography which is an excellent book mm. and um I, i'm going to play you mm. a, a, a huge compliment here because I, I read it a very long time about 20 years ago and it's older that is 1972 is it was it published in 1972 that book 72 years yeah and um i remember mm. reading it and it's and um assuming and i mean this is a compliment assuming that um because it was such a it seemed so scholarly and what well, it was scholarly and, and of a mature sort of nature they, the the person who wrote, wrote that must have been much older and 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 presumably must no. have passed away but um but so you know and it's a, and it's a really overlooked book uh a, a character and you you really brought that to life for me so i i owe you a real, a real debt mm. there how old if you don't mind me asking and you don't have to oh, answer that. if you don't want to uh, how old were you in when you wrote that the, the book on levy Oh, I was um, approaching thirty. Oh, okay, okay. So, yeah, but still, it's. Mm. It, I, I thought it was a man much, much more, you know, mature because it was so well written and uh, thoughtfully presented. Mm. So, mm. Uh, yeah, and uh, mm. I think oh, Levy is a, is very influential. Mm. You know, people are, he's a bit sort of underrated. I think too, a bit too much these days, and I think his influence is often overlooked. And if you and if you did read those books, you realize mm. how. How much he's he's there he's there for us it's excellent also you know like yes, idea, like his idea of the um his concept of the actual life always said that in some ways he anticipated you know the ideas of the young conscious like the freudian ideas of the conscious almost yes yes that was a very seminal concept the astral yeah. light yeah yeah yes. yeah yeah so um what brought you to to russia and the occult in russia Well, previous to this book, I wrote another book called Beyond the North Wind, which deals with the mystique of the North. And part of that mystique is the notion of Hyperborea, Hyperborea, the fabled land in the North. Hyperborea meaning the land beyond the North Wind. Boreas being the north wind. So this was thought of as a um, sort of never, never land in the far north, somewhere in the polar region, bef before the polar region got covered by ice, or, or perhaps in some sort of freak temperate zone in the middle of the ice, where this precursor civilization existed. And this idea took root in Russia very strongly. Um, I discovered this while, while writing the book Beyond the North Wind. And uh, that led me on to other traditions in Russia that I found very interesting. And as I knew the Russian language, I, I began to look into it more deeply. And decided to write this book so that's how it came about one thing that struck me early in the book you speak about um and i've i've sort of observed this myself as well it, it, you you speak about how war and kind of social decline kind of tends to inspire a new wave of of art and kind of uh like new art movements um and that certainly seems to be the case in russia yes uh, that's that's true. Well, I think there are a certain periods when there are powerful currents flowing in, you could say, the collective mind of the age. And these manifest themselves in various, various ways, in various kinds of social unrest, um, upheaval, 
before they erupt, erupt into some great, um, some great upheaval, um, these same currents can also drive, uh, and uh, you had this, for example, in, in Austria, in, in Vienna, in the last decades of the Habsburg Empire, which was a period of great creativity. Um, you had it also in um, Germany towards the end of the Weimar Republic. And you also, you also had it in this period in Russia bef before the revolution, which was a tr tremendously creative period, um, which is often called the Silver Age. The Silver Age, which was cut off, but basically by the revolution, although, although to some extent it continued after the revolution, but um, was had, had more, more or less um, disappeared by the time Stalin came along. Yeah, interesting. So, um, well, another thing I noticed as well throughout the book is that the Russians mm. seem kind of preoccupied with for use of a better term kind of new eons or new 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 phases um it, it, does that make any sense it, they sort of seem to really each sort of uh paganistic group always seems to have this kind of thing in the future that it it's it's sort of leaning towards and um i noticed that throughout the book it seems to all the different groups all seem yeah. to have this kind of lean do you think this is a a russian predicament or is this a I think it is. I think it is. I think it probably has something to do with the history, with the religious history of Russia. Um, Russia basically converted to Orthodox Christianity in the 10th century uh, under Prince Vladimir, and at that time they looked towards Constantinople, which was the spiritual center of orthodoxy. Well, then, then what happened was that Constantinople was overrun by the Turks and Constant Constantinople ceased to have that role. And what happened was that the, the then Tsar, uh, Ivan III, who was married to a niece of the Byzantine emperor, decided, I think, partly under the influence of, of his wife, who, was, who appears to have been a, a very forceful woman, to declare that Muscovy had become, had taken over the role of Constantinople and had become, as, as they called it, the third Rome. So that the first Rome being the Rome on the Tiber, the second being Constantinople, and the third being Russia or Mus Muscovy. So they, they already had this, this idea of a, of a threefold process, process going on in history. And this, uh, this also is connected with the, with the notion of the Antichrist, that um, there was going to come a, a time when the, the Antichrist would, would come and, and introduce a reign of evil, which, which would then, and then a savior would come and get rid of the Antichrist and introduce a new golden age. Well, there have been certain periods in Russian history when it appeared that the, the, Antich the Antichrist had come. For example, there was a split in the Orthodox Church in the 17th century when a a group, the split was over some reforms that had taken place in the church. Uh, one was that um, in, instead of doing the, the, the sign of the cross with two fingers to uh, symbolize the dual nature of Christ, that it would thenceforth be done with three fingers. Well, to, today we would think of that as a, as a a rather minor point, but to them it was very important. And so this this group of uh, schematic group broke away and they called themselves the old believers, Th thousands and thousands of them. And 
they considered that the mainstream of the Orthodox Church was, was under the Antichrist. And you had this theme of the Antichrist coming in again under communism. There were many, many people who thought that Stalin was the Antichrist. So this, this, this kind of millenarian thinking is, is very much sort of rooted in the, the, the Russian mentality. And it, it's still there to, to, to a great extent. Yeah, and then there's those, those heretical. You you mentioned it in the uh, with Mr. McIntosh. Uh, the um, the there those heretical notions uh, they sort of inherited as well of like uh, the the age of the um, the, the Holy Spirit isn't the age of the Father and Mother. Uh, the where, where does it go again? That's but, right. Yes, uh, I've got. I'm getting it modelled. <laughs> You're going to have to remind me. But, well, uh, it, it, it it go it goes back to. The Italian mystic Joachim of Fiore, the me medieval Italian mystic, who put forward the idea that history proceeds in three ages. First, first comes the age of the father, which is the, is the age of law. And then comes the age of the son, which is the, the age of the gospel. And then finally, the age of the Holy Spirit, which is going to be a, a reign of peace and love and, and happiness. So um, the, yeah, this was this was also very strong in, in Russia, and um, it also ties in with what they called the the woman clothed with the sun. This is this is something that goes back to the Book of Revelation, where there's mention of a woman clothed with the sun who's going to give birth to a savior. But there's a, a seven-headed dragon who's who has come and is threatening to devour the, the saviour, but the Archangel Michael comes and conquers the dragon. Archangel Michael is, a, is another very important symbol in Russia. You, you see it all over the place on coats of arms and, and so on. So, and this woman clothed with the sun became a very important symbol in Russia. And she crops up all over <clears throat> the place again and again in different forms. And she crops up, for example, during the Second World War, when Stalin realized that the communist ideology was not enough to mobilize the country against the Germans. And so he, he tried to stir up the patriotic spirit. And one of the ways he did it was introducing the figure of Mother Russia, um, mother homeland, Mat Rodina, as she, she's called. And everywhere there, there appeared posters of a, um, a radiant, strong, radiant woman brandishing a sword mm -hmm. and with the, the slogan, Mother Homeland Calls. So this, this is another, another version, really, of this woman clothed with the sun. It's, it's, it's one of those things that I call egregores, mm -hmm. of which there are quite a number, and egre an egregore being a collective thought form created by many people focusing on the same ideas and symbols and having the same thoughts. Yeah, we did an interesting interview with um, Mark Stavish about egregores. He, he wrote a book called Egregores. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, and we... we oh, yes, yes. Yeah. I, yes. Also, when I was reading the book, I I, I immediately recognised that that you know very dramatic image of the woman uh, brandishing the sword. But I never made, didn't really uh, know what it was, so <laughs> I didn't realise that it was Mother uh, yes, Russia. Yes. Rod, Rod, is it Rodnia? Is that mm. would you say? And Rod means like Rodina. Rodina. Rodina, and then and Rod means like root, or it means uh, uh, yeah, in, yes. in Russian, yeah, it's like uh, it's an interesting. It's, yeah. it's, it's an interesting word because the word rod, yes, as you say, it's cognate with root. And um, rod is also the name of the supreme creator in the, the Russian uh, pre-Christian pagan tradition. Rod is he's the sort of the source, the, the source of everything, the source from which the whole universe flows, basically. Rod. And the, the word rod appears 
in many other forms. For example, the, the word for parents in Russia is roditeli, roditeli. And as, uh, yes, and, and um, as you say in the word rodina, and um, in various other contexts. So, so the, the, the concept of the rod is, is something very, very deep, rooted in the, in the language itself. Yeah, um, there were a few, uh, quite a few examples of, oh, sorry, go on. <laughs> well, I was just going to say another, another example is the word um, priroda, which means nature, priroda, which means sort of the, the primal root. Yeah, as I was saying a second ago, there's um, quite a few examples of egregores when you in the book, quite near the start. And I was wondering if we could have a look at some of them. One yeah. that one that um, introduced me, um, interested me rather, was the the warrior hero. I thought was interesting, um, and also the holy. Oh yes, there's the holy fool, and there's a few others. So maybe we could have a, you know, you, you could introduce some of these egregores to us. Yeah. Um, well, the yeah, one of them is, as you say, is the the warrior hero. Um, this this is this is a powerful. This is it's, of course it's not confer, confined to Russia because it does crop up in other countries, but um, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, a sort of yeah, it's an, an egregore, a kind of archetype which gets acted out by by actual historical figures, for, for example, by Alexander Nevsky, Prince Alexander Nevsky, who <clears throat> fought against the, the Teutonic Knights when they invaded Russia in the 15th century. And this, the, the figure of Ale Alexander Nevsky was invoked during the Second World War. Um, in the, the film by Sergei Eisenstein about Alexander Nevsky. Um, so that's another another example of, of an egregore. Yeah. Uh, what what others are the well the um, the, the concept of the the never never land, the the, the faraway place, paradisical place, inaccessible except to those who are worthy to, to find it. And um, uh, an example of that is in Russian tradition, Bielovodje, the land of the white waters. This, this is, again, connected with the, the old believers because uh, around the, the early 19th century, reports began to circulate of a place where the thousands of old believers had taken refuge somewhere somewhere in the far east, and um, they called it Bielovodje, and uh, meant many people tried to find it, but it, it really, I, I think it was it was basically a legendary place, and um, this this legend of, of Bielovodje. The subject of Bielovodje has been taken up by artists, so there are paintings, fantastic paintings of, of this imaginary place. And there's even a TV series called Bielovodje, where people, where it's, it's kind of a parallel universe where people disappear through certain portals into this, into this world of Bielovodje, rather like in, in those novels by Philip Pullman, where where those portals that portals in certain places where people disappear into a sort of parallel world. Okay. So that would be another example. A bit like uh, coming back to the Hyperborea, you know, the uh, the you know that's at the ultimate yeah. end of the of the world, really, isn't it? And uh, hyper, you know, literally Hyperborea, hyper beyond beyond the Boreas, the the cave where. He's supposed to have lived. Yeah. I think there was a there was a legend also that he um, there were uh, griffins and cyclopses who sort of constantly fought over the gold or something in that very fantastical kind of image. 
and also uh, hyperborea nice. had a big influence on the theosophists didn't they Plato, you know the the, uh, the ideas around land yeah, and, right, yes. and the theosophists i think the theosophists had this idea it was like a sort of paradise of that, get, that draws on greek things as well and they had these yes. in, i'm going to say strange ideas well Anyways, there are these ideas about the, the the original Hyperboreans being like some kind of um, sort of perfect perfect beings, like hermaphrodite like beings or something, and that the, the Hyperboreans are supposed to be you know a race that lived for a thousand years and were constantly happy, and so there was like that kind of uh, before, like Eden before the fall, I suppose. Yes, well, there are many different versions of the Hyperborean legend. The, the, the Russians have cottoned onto it in, big, in a big way, and at one point there was there was even a Russian admiral who, who set sail to try and find Hyperborea, but at, at some point he got blocked by the ice and had to turn back. But it was taken up in a big way, for example, in the 20th century, there, there was a a Russian archaeologist, Alexander Babchenko, who around the 1920s led an expedition to the extreme northwest of Russia, to especially to an area called the Kola Peninsula, in basically in search of remains of Hyperborea. And he found all sorts of remarkable things like pyramids, the remains of paved roads, labyrinths, and things of that sort. And he was in fact convinced that he'd found Hyperborea. And there've been other expeditions since, since, since the fall of communism, that there've been further expeditions to that region. And there's a, there's a whole sort of cult of Hyperborea. There's, uh, for example, a whole school of painting showing fantastic images of Hyperborean cities, people being people riding around on sleighs drawn by mammoths and so on. Even even scenes with spaceships landing in a Hyperborean environment mm. and things of that sort. So it, it's, a, it's a very interesting phenomenon. Mm. And, and the Russians, well, many, many, many Russians see themselves as the, the true descendants, the true, as the true inheritors or true, true heirs of the Hyperboreans. Yeah, I've, I've I've actually seen uh, Mr. McIntosh. Some of those images you, you're talking about, are, you know, with the the cities with uh, with the sort yeah. of tame mammoths in it, sort of trundling around and stuff like that. Sort mm. of, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, well, I mean, mammoths did survive in Siberia, didn't they? I think for, for I think like two thousand years ago, there oh, were some they did, mammoths. Yes. Yeah, so, and they and and they're and, and they're famous for finding the, the ones frozen in the you know in the they got whole museums of like frozen. Preserved mammoths. That's right. By the words. Yeah. 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 No, it's interesting. One thing, another point in the book that I found quite interesting, which is vaguely linked to what we're just talking about now, is um, you speak about how in modernity, uh, the West kind of separated spirituality and the avant garde. And, um, I, yeah. uh, but Russia didn't seem to do that, did it? And why do you think that is? Well, it, it's an interesting, interesting question. Um, as as you say, um, in the West, the avant-garde tends to be secular, um, whereas in Russia, that's not the case. The, Ru the Russians are a deeply spiritual people, but during the communist years, there was a kind of enforced secularity. And um, so to, to be avant-garde was, was to be against that secularity. To be, to be avant-garde was to be religious and spiritual. And um, so e even under communism, if, if you were a writer, for example, you tried to find ways to express um, spirituality. Uh, but, um, um, classic example would be Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was um, a deeply religious man. And uh, so after the fall of communism, writers and artists 
simply simply returned to their natural spirituality. And I, I think that's still the case today. Hmm. You know, um, Mark, I think you were interested in asking about Rasputin. Well, <laughs> I, I, thought we, I thought we'd get on to the Holy Fool uh, or the... the uh, archetype oh, yeah. yeah i mean he does he, he does yeah rasputin is uh, you know there's obviously a lot more to russia than rasputin but um he's well he's a, he's a very common sort of image that people think of and and he and it's interesting yeah. he, he does he does fall into the the holy man who wanders around um taking his sort of preaching yeah. from yeah. place to place and also like the holy the holy fool idea uh, i know the romanovs they were very they mm. had before rasputin they had another holy f- or called i think he was called something peter the innocent mm. or some something like that and uh, and uh, so yeah he's, mm. he's one of those figures yeah. that uh, you know sort of leaps out uh, well on, on the subject of, on the subject of rasputin uh, last week i was in i was in berkeley california and um one day i was passing a, a music shop and outside the shop was a big sign saying Rasputin music. <laughs> and uh, it depicted, it, it depicted um, Rasputin dressed in a kind of hippie costume and uh, playing an electric guitar. Uh, uh, so um, to me, that, that says something about Rasputin's enduring sort of in, in, enduring appeal um, he, he, he was a kind of hippie um, ahead of his time but he, he was obviously much more than a hippie he was um, uh, as, as you say uh, well he's, he's, an, he's an example of this Russian tradition of the starets the, the independent holy man and um, the ind- independent holy man and sage and prophet. And um, he, despite his, despite his uh, notoriety and his sort of wild and profligate life, there's, there's no doubt that he was a genuinely pious person and that he had genuine gifts of healing. Other, other words, otherwise he wouldn't have been able to heal the the Zarevich. Um, so I think he, I, I think he's 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 someone who is um, uh, has, has been somewhat unjustly treated. Yeah, he's an intriguing figure. He remains an intriguing figure, and uh, uh, when he was um, assassinated, yes. yeah, and they they they. There's a photograph of him of his body, isn't there? And he's he's he looks like he's sign making yes, signing. Yes. I, I don't, don't know if he's doing it with two fingers or three fingers. I, don't, I can't tell. But um, uh, but also as well, just just after when he he was um, assassinated, they um, they built a chapel to him next to the to the river there. Or, and um, yeah. but of course, when uh, you know communism swept in soon after that was leveled to the ground but there's a lot you know it, it's intriguing thinking there's an alternative universe where that didn't happen and there's like a shrine there's like a there's like yeah. a, a temple like a shrine to mm. Rasputin and it'd be interesting to see is it just intriguing yeah. to imagine well what 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 history what narrative around Ras- Rasputin accumulate in that if, if history had changed a lot that little bit yeah when uh, yeah, so mm. speculating away then. Yeah, I found. Um, well, he's 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 a very. Uh, no, go on, continue. Sorry, <laughs> there's a bit of a delay. He's, so he's it's a very, um, he's a very he's a, he's a very Russian figure. I think um, it's difficult for people outside Russian Russia to understand a figure like that, because he does belong to this figure of the starets and the the sort of eccentric. Uh, eccentric character like like the holy fool he, he belongs to that whole tradition which is very russian yeah i think you're absolutely right i think you're totally right mm. one um kind of parallel you draw in the book is between rasputin and i think his is alexander duggin or dugin um 
uh, Dugin, yeah. yeah they do seem to there, there does seem to be a parallel but they do seem to be quite different in other ways could you talk about this kind of connection between the two well um they they are they have similarities and dissimilarities um <clears throat> rasputin was not an intellectual he came from a, a rather humble background um he, he wasn't he wasn't particularly educated. Um, he was really, really a man of the people. Whereas Dugin, Dugin is is very much an intellectual. Um, but he ha they, he has the same has the similar sort of charisma. Um, to be to be a, a staretz, you you have to have charisma, and Dugin definitely has that. Uh, but he's, he's also provocative. The, the, the Staretz is often, is often provocative in, in what he says. And Dugin, is, uh, Dugin again, is, is provocative. But he's, he, he, he's very stimulating, has some, some very interesting ideas, even, even if you don't agree with everything he says. So was, um, would you say it was Rasputin a traditionalist in the same way that uh, Dugin or Dugin was? Yeah, I think he was. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Dugin du Ying now is a is a traditionalist, but he he comes from a far more complex sort of background, doesn't he? With yeah. you know, in, involvement. Was, with uh, what... He was originally a kind of hippie. Yeah. yeah. And and um, elements of chaos magic and other things, which still creeping, funny enough. Yeah. Are still in his DNA. Movie, Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. I was um, particularly interested to see that um, Eisenstein was. Uh, technically an occultist um especially he was very uh well, yeah was it he, he was a member of a rosicrucian well, lodge i believe well th this was something that surprised me greatly um when i came across a photograph of him with some other members of the rosicrucian lodge and they're, they're all dressed in the uniform of the red Ar of the, of the uh, yeah the red army this was during the civil war and um, in the first place, I wouldn't have expected him to, to be to have been a, a member of a Rosicrucian lodge. It's not not something one would associate with Eisenstein. And secondly, that it was the Red Army that he was a member of, uh, because we tend to think of um, well, uh, uh, as I said as I said earlier, communism was was very secular and um, anti anti-spiritual, anti, anti those kinds of things. So um, it, it was surprising that Eisenstein was a member of this lodge. But um, that, that was one of a number of Rosicrucian lodges and, and other similar groups that were active at the time of the revolution and, and even up to the beginning of the Stalinist regime. But um, when when Stalin really started to clamp down, these these organisations were crushed, and many of their members died in the Gulag. Mm -hmm. So um, by the <clears throat> by the end of the Stalinist period, there, there weren't wasn't much of that kind of thing going on. Yeah. Um... So obviously, one character we we mention a lot on this podcast. Uh, it seems that not an episode goes past where we don't mention him. Actually, is uh, Alistair Crowley? He's our patron saint. Yeah, so. <laughs> and um, obviously Crowley oh, yes. Crowley was kind of deeply moved by Russia, wasn't he? Um, and obviously uh, created two quite fundamental texts whilst he was out there, um, or was at least inspired whilst he was out there. Could you uh, talk to that? Yeah. At all? Yeah, um, well, Crowley, um, at one point, he th thought of going into the diplomatic corps and he decided, uh, I think he decided to learn Russian. I think that was one of the reasons why he, he went there. Anyway, he was, he was deeply impressed by Russia and uh, wrote a very uh, eloquent, description of Moscow 
and he um, yes as as you say it was it was while he was there that he he wrote his famous hymn to pan well <clears throat> today there there is a crowleyan movement and <clears throat> at one point as i think as i mentioned in the book uh, when Dugin was a candidate for the Russian parliament. A concert was held to promote his candidacy um, by um, a group led by a musician called Kuryakin. And during, during this meeting, Crowley actually read a passage from, I think it was the Book of the Law. Well, um, as I say, there's, there, there is now a, a, a Carolian movement. It's, it's not very large. I think it's I think it's, can be numbered in the hundreds rather than the thousands. But um, Crowley's name is is still very much present. I mean, if you if you go into an esoteric bookshop in Moscow or St. Petersburg or one of one of the other cities, you you will find books by Crowley uh, and on Crowley. It sounds, it sounds like they've got more books than we have here. You can't can't find any Crowley books in England at the moment. It's typical. <laughs> uh, also, as well, the you got uh, you, he also wrote the Gnostic Catholic Mass uh, uh, during his time in um, in Russia and um, uh, inspired by the Russian Orthodox Church and their. Yeah. I've 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 seen the Greek Orthodox Mass performed and it's got similarities. It's got the we call it in England the rude screen, the screen that separates the congregation. Oh, and, yes. and the elements are consecrated behind that. And there's also, you know, there's character. I mean, I mean, I, I, I didn't know what I was looking at. And <laughs> so forgive my ignorance, but, you know, you have like a priest going into the rude screen, going into the screen and then, you know, consecrating the elements and then he comes out in wearing a completely different sort of costume and so on. And, 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 Crowley clearly yeah. uh, didn't be, uh, incorporated or taking some of those those ritualistic sort of um, mm. dynamics from from it and incorporated them in into the Gnostic Mass. From well, that's from that's very that's very interesting. I, I I actually wasn't aware of that. Yeah, well, it's, during the Gnostic uh, Mass, there's a similar thing of of the the priest uh, changing his uh, his costume when he becomes like becomes the active priest. If you see what I mean. The priest that's, is consecrated that's, like that. That's, that's very fascinating. I, I had no idea that Crowley's Gnostic Mass was influenced by the Orthodox liturgy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's worth comparing in the two. You'll definitely see the parallels. Yeah, it's, it's actually when yeah. you when you read it on the on the cold page, it's it's difficult mm. to visualize what actually is going on. Is if you actually see mm. the Gnostic Mass, you'll you'll anyway. Yeah, well, the the the, orth the Orthodox liturgy is. Ex Extremely powerful. I mean, I, I, I've attended, I've attended the liturgy on, on a number of occasions, and I find it very moving. And as you say, one of the characteristics of Orthodox churches is this, what they call the iconostasis. It's the this screen behind which the Eucharist is consecrated, and so it gives the whole thing an element of mystery and concealment which which um creates something very powerful yeah interesting so um well we haven't really broached it um but what is the kind of state of paganism in russia at the moment um obviously it, it seems to it, it seems to come in waves in russia doesn't it um but it always seems to re-emerge mm. even after great um restrictions yeah, yeah. by 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 you know powers of authority um, so, but I mean, obviously, yeah. it's not quite the you know, but, it's not the Stalinist Russia we're in right now. But it's uh, it's it's a a, a a slightly repressed Russia. So it'd be I'm interested to know like how how the pagan movement is kind of you know how it how it's how it how it's settled at the moment kind of thing. Yeah. Well, you you have to remember that Russia is a huge country. Uh, incorporating many different nationalities and ethnic groups and and so on so there there are many different forms of paganism but basically 
there are two levels of paganism. There are the, the indigenous pagan traditions, um, which have existed since before Christianity came. Um, of course, very, very different from the forms of paganism that we know in, in the West. There's, um, for example, there are, there are domestic deities like um, this um, a household spirit that they call the, the domovoi, the domovoi, dom being, being house or home. And um, he's, he's generally, generally a sort of benevolent spirit, but he sometimes gets upset if you don't keep the house tidy and so on. And he's, he's um, portrayed as a little kind of hairy monkey-like humanoid and um, he's uh, he's still he's still there. You, if you go to mar markets where folk crafts are being sold, you find little statuettes of him, the, the Dumovoi. Yeah. Oh, um, well, sorry, I was going to I was going to say it's an intriguing yeah. intriguing. I was really intrigued by the 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 link there I, I, between the, in in this part of the world we have you know and in the United Kingdom I don't know about the rest of Europe mm. but you have the idea of the brownie. He's like a kind of uh, like a domestic brownie, yeah. like elf food or whatever. He's very similar. It was intriguing as well that they uh, you have to sort of have a well ordered house or the the brownie uh, or in this case this sort of sort of character get, becomes sort of uh, agitated and you have to leave out offerings as well. That that that, that was intriguing because the yeah, same, yeah. it's the same narrative. I, you know, it was the same narrative. Reminds me of like the Roman concept of the household gods as well. Going back even further, to... yes, 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 but but traditions like that are still are still very strong, and uh, as as a, you as I say, you will see little images of this domovoi. Um, well, then go, going up the scale, as it were, there are nature deities. For example, there's one called Veles, who's an, sort of the equivalent of Pan in the West. Then there's Perkunas, who's um, a thunder god, so, sort of the equivalent of Thor. And then um, Kupola, the, the god of summer and the, the harvest and fertility. And um, yeah, the, the, those are some of them. Well, these these have survived. These these pre-Christian deities have survived to some extent and have been revived in recent times. The, uh, some of them some of them have merged with with uh, Christian Christian saints. For example, uh, Coppola um, is um, he's been sort of co-opted by. By Christianity, so there's, there's a, a midsummer festival, um, which dates from before Christianity, but it's, it's now been re renamed Ivan Coppola, John John Coppola, which takes place at, at midsummer, and uh, has become a festival of Saint John. But um, there, are, there are many pagans who still celebrate it as a as a pagan festival, and um, one of the places they celebrate it is. A prehistoric site called um, uh, um, I forget the name of it now. It's in the it's in the Urals, and it's sort of the equivalent of um, Stonehenge in England. And so thousands of people go there at midsummer to celebrate this Ivan Kapola um, festival. So that that's one example of um, a neo-pagan phenomenon. Um, and there are, there are many um, neo-pagan neo groups. There are neo-pagan priests who, who perform um, pagan, pagan burials, marriages, rites of passage, and so on. Um, so that's, that, that <coughs> yeah. That, that's that's sort of the, what I can say about paganism. 
and also sort of they in that little pantheon of sort of animistic sort of creatures there's there's there's, there's a leashy is it is it pronounced leashy i'm i'm going to murder all the russian language completely in this podcast but is it the leashy the hairy the hairy creature that lives in the forest the wild, oh yes, the like leche, the leche, ah, yes, ah, yes, the leche, yeah. He's yeah, kind of, right. yeah, yes. like a hairy, it's like um, a wild, like a wood woe, is like a hairy man of the forest. Yes, that, yes that, that's right. Yes, yeah. yes. And I've seen, I've, um, it's, I think somewhere in Russia, they pre he's represented as like a hairy, small hairy creature, with like a like a horn, a single horn, like almost like a unicorn. Is that right? Yeah. Am I? I think, did I dream I that? Really, <laughs> did I? The, <laughs> I yeah, interesting. So, what about um, kind of more like, esoteric groups and things like that in Russia? Like you said that there's a kind of crony, like an OTO kind of movement there. But what about kind of other groups? Yeah. Like, is there you know are other groups represented there as well? Did they survive the kind of um, you know the communist era and like the Rosicrucians, for example? Are they still active in Russia? Or? Oh, oh yes. Um... Basically, all, all the groups that you, you would find in the West are active in Russia. That's interesting. For example, uh, the, the theosophy is quite strong. Of course, Madame Lavatsky didn't found theosophy in Russia. She founded it in New York, but it, it very quickly found its way back to Russia. So there is, there is a theosophical movement. There is anthroposophy. There, there is also oh, uh, a whole range of, of sort of new age movements, some of which have been imported from the West, but some of which are indigenous to Russia. I mean, for, for example, the, the Rurik movement founded by the painter Nico, <coughs> Nikolai Rurik and his wife Helena, who was clairvoyant. And... Uh, Helena Rurik, in fact, channeled one of the masters of theosophy called Moria, and he transmitted to her a whole teaching which centered around the concept of Agni, which is the sort of, the, 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 it, it's from the, 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 the word meaning fire, and Agni, it's co co cognate with a, a Russian word, Ogon. And it's similar to the concept of the Chi or, or the Prana in the, in the Vedic tradition. So they developed this idea, this doctrine of Agni Yoga. So there's quite a strong Agni Yoga movement in Russia today. Yeah. And, um, well... <clears throat> Those are some some examples of what's going on. Yeah, I was, I was intrigued by the uh, Rorik, and the he, he was very much in, involved with the like Buddhism and the the Buddhist temple in 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 Saint Petersburg. Is that is that right? Is, is yeah, Saint Saint Petersburg, yes, yeah, Saint Petersburg. Which yeah, Saint Petersburg. which is has, has been, been been restored and is now once again uh, a, a Buddhist center. Yeah, and 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 his amazing art. I mean, it's there's a serenity to his art. You can, it just sort of sweeps you up, doesn't it? It's 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 quite it's, it's extraordinary. Yeah, it I, is. I, is it? Yeah, it's, yeah. I'd it love. It's amazing. Yeah, yes, I've never seen any of his work in real life, and I'm as that's become a bit of an ambition mm. now. I want to. I want to actually sort of see that in real life. Well, there's um, there's there's a heroic museum in New York on the Upper West Side. A wonderful place that I used to go to when I lived in New York. And um, <clears throat> so if, if you're ever in New York, it's worth going there. I think it's moved building, hasn't it? It had to move building for some obscure reason. I'm not sure why. Yeah, that's that's right. Hmm. And well, was... at, at one point, at one point, um, Rurik had a rich American patron. I, th I think he was called Horsch. Horsch. And this patron built a, a museum. He, he built a, a skyscraper on the Upper West Side of New York to house Rurik's, Rurik's collection and be a kind of Rurik center. But then 
he and Rurik had a, a falling out. And so that museum was closed down and it moved just a very short distance away to, to a street nearby where, where it's now located. Yeah, and uh, well, there was also that intriguing narrative with the meteorite uh, and the, the, the wish granting gem. Or... That comes from sort of the Buddhist idea. Oh, yes, idea, the Chintamani yeah. stone, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Somehow connected with the Graal, and you know, that, that's that intriguing mixture of the East and the West, though, as well, sort of those narratives. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, so he, he, he thought this Chintamani stone was, was basically going to transform the world. Yeah, yeah, and also, and also another character uh, connected with Gurdjieff was Ospensky. He 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 was native to well, yeah he lived in Gurdjieff Russia. Was... Um, was influenced by uh, influenced by Levy, wasn't he as well? Uh, Ospensky. I, I've I've seen some of his. Uh, he did some illustrations, and it looked like you could see Levy's sort of influence in them. Um, yeah, I don't know much about him. I mean. Uh, uh, it, how, how much of the the Gurdjieff work is 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 popular or resonates with the Russian people? Uh, oh yeah, oh yes. There's, there's quite a strong Gurdjieff movement still going today. Yeah, interesting. Well, I think um, it's one of these books where we could just keep dipping into yeah. you know all sorts of. I mean, it's, it's so laden with information, but <laughs> yeah. yeah um, I do really yeah. appreciate you giving us some of your time. Um, if um, people wanted to find you online, where would they, or, you know, find your, your work, or where would you point them? Well, I think the easiest thing is if they go to my website. Um, the, the address is www.osgard, that's spelled O-Z-G-A-R-D, dot net so it's www.osgard.net well brilliant well thank you so much for giving us some of your time i really appreciate it um and uh maybe we'll have you back on at some point to talk about uh, uh levi or levy how yeah. do you how, how do i've never known how to I say a Lef, lfs levy but i don't yeah. know if that's right yeah i, I levy, hear it levy. Yes, yeah, yeah. Le, levy that's what i thought but anyway mm. maybe we'll um we'll have to have you on and uh uh, talk about uh, yeah. uh, that would be a that would be a tr that would be a real treat mm -hmm. that would be that would be something special. No, that would, uh, Brilliant. That would be a pleasure. And thank you to everyone who watched today. This has been a bit we've we've been kind of stuck in this mode uh, because of uh, some some gremlins. So we haven't changed. You know, we're, we're in this sort of two up mode here. So uh, um, normally this will be a bit more dynamic. We'll be you know moving moving uh, frames around. But uh, but anyway, thanks to uh, people that uh, stuck around and watched. Um, We'll see you next week, and uh, thank you again, Christopher. It was uh, it was a real pleasure. Thank you very much, sir.